Welcome back, everyone. It is our final seminar of the Fall 2021 Water Wetlands and Watershed Seminar Series. Um, we've had a great seminar so far, and we have an excellent speaker to, you know, back clean up here for us, um, an old alumni, alumnus of um, University of Florida. So let me please introduce Dr. Jason Evans. Um, Dr. Evans is the Executive Director of Stetson University's Institute for Water and Environmental Resilience. Jason uh, received his MS and PhD from UF's Interdisciplinary Ecology Program, so y'all might know that as SNRE, and he took many classes in the Center for Wetlands and the Systems Ecology Programs. Dr. Evans is now a leading researcher, practitioner, and teacher in the fields of coastal resilience and climate adaptation planning. Um, in recent years, he's been working on coastal hazards and habitat change uh, associated with sea level rise here in Florida, but also uh, throughout the Southern Atlantic Coast, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina and been funded by NOAA's Sea Grant and Coastal Zone Management Programs. Jason's also serving as the co-editor-in-chief for the Journal of Environmental Management, which is a top-ranked international publication that covers topics of environmental science, engineering, planning, and governance. And I think that's relevant because you're gonna tell us some stories about science, a little bit of stories about policy, perhaps some governance, and um, I don't know, maybe you'll show us a, a picture of some wetlands. I don't know if you'll, if you'll show us a video of you, you and your son's um, latest rock hit, rock tune, but maybe for the next talk. So uh, Dr. Evans, Jason, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. All right, y'all. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it is wonderful to be here with y'all. Oh, I wish I was up in Gainesville hanging out, but hopefully next year. Um, all right. Well, let's see. Can you guys see my screen here? No, I unshared it to give you the live okay. test of whether you can share. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. All right. Let me try this again. All right. Looks like it's screen sharing now. Perfect. All right. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much. And I'm going to start here with a picture. This is up in Hyde County, North Carolina, which is way up on the eastern shore of North Carolina, incredibly low lying area. And um, it's known for getting hit by hurricanes. It's known for flooding and it's known for the retreat of the forest. So we're looking at a coastal wetland here. And if we would have taken the same picture about 25 years ago, that would have been a pine forest. Um, so pretty rapid retreat in this area. Um, and so, yeah, uh, so we're going to do just a little story. I'm going to go through, I've been working with local governments up and down the Southeast for the, about the past, I don't know, 10, 11 years or so uh, working on sea level rise. And uh, yeah, just going to share some stories with you all today. So, all right, let's see if this is going to work for me. All right, there we go. All right, so uh, this is my view. Actually, I wanted to start with this. So this is uh, uh, this is the Aquatic Center here at Stetson, and uh, this is my lab. Um, so I'm actually right here, sitting sitting right there. Um, and uh, so this is our stormwater pond. This is what it looked like last year. Um, it doesn't look quite like this right now in the winter, but um, we got some floating wetlands. We've got uh, littoral plantings all around and it's lots of fun there. Well, we also have a little trail that's out in the lake and uh, it's Hontoon Island's about two miles to uh, my south. So very, very beautiful spot. And we've got loads of manatees in this area as well. So uh, this is kind of an open invitation for y'all to come and see us. And uh, this is what it looks like today. So this is uh, this is my rain garden bioswale. And actually, University of Florida is here today. This is in the other room. We actually have a master naturalist class that's happening. Uh, one room over. So uh, UF is here. All right. So we're going to talk about the coast. And so, um, so over the past 10 years or so, these are all the places I've worked. And, and the way I got into sea level rise, it's, um, it's one of these interesting things. When I was at UF, when I was at the Center for Wetlands, when I was SNRE, I didn't work on sea level rise at all. I was actually working on springs. And, um, and so I got a job at University of Georgia. Um, so I went to, uh, I started UGA in 2010. So let's see, March of 2010. And, um, in my second day at UGA, they said, you need to go raise money <laughs> um, and you need to go and figure out how to fund yourself. And, and so um, and so I started working uh, with the Sea Grant program and I uh, worked with Chuck Hopkinson, who you guys might know. So he's a wetlands ecologist. He uh, was the Georgia Sea Grant director. And we bonded pretty soon after I got there because he's a systems ecologist. And, and so, um, so we started working and plotting on how we could bring some systems ideas into this idea of coast resilience. And I started off with thinking, you know, I know how to model things in GIS and how hard can it be to model sea level rise? 
And it turns out it's not that hard. Um, but, you know, once you get into the governance and you get into what does it look like in the future and the uncertainty and what do you do about it, that's really where it gets challenging and interesting. All right. And so I always like to start with, yes, the sea is rising. So we've got a bunch of tide gauges up and down the coast. So this is down at Key West. This is the reference that we typically use for Florida. Uh, so this tide gauge goes back to 1913. And you can see it's about nine inches over 100 years that we've seen at Key West. And you go up a little bit in the coast in the Keys at Vaca Keys Marathon. Um, there it's rising faster. And this is a more uh, recent gauge. It was installed in the 70s. And so if you use that trend, it's about 13 and a half inches over 100 years. Uh, you go up to Fort Myers, one foot over 100 years. Uh, you go up to Georgia. So we see about one foot over 100 years at Fort Pulaski. And uh, you go up to Charleston, one foot, and then uh, you have North Carolina. So uh, uh, you get the idea. The sea's rising up and down the Atlantic coast. It's rising, in fact, all across the world. And why is the sea rising? So this is just a little bit of basic science. So for one, with global warming, as, as uh, the ocean warms, uh, then the water expands, right? So that's just, that's just simple physics. And that's about 60, 70 percent of the sea level rise that we've seen over the past 100 years or so is just that expansion from the warming. And then, of course, we get the melting ice. And so and that could be from glaciers that are in mountains that can be from ice sheets, uh, for example, at Greenland. Um, that's about 25, 30 percent of the sea level rise that we've seen. And there's a little bit more when you get into the sea level rise science and even things like groundwater that that we extract from aquifers for irrigation as that runs off into the sea. That apparently also has a little bit of a sea level rise effect. It's very, very minor, but, but, but there are actually attempts to try to quantify that. But uh, so it's mostly, again, the warming water and then the ice. Um, and so we've, again, seen about between you know, nine inches, maybe a foot of sea level rise here in Florida over the past 100 years. And of course, we expect that to increase. And there, seems to be some evidence that it's already starting to accelerate. So this is where it gets complicated. As we look into climate change and we look into the future, we see all sorts of curves like this. And so uh, this is uh, from 2017 from NOAA. They have a whole bunch of different scenarios going out to the year 2100, all the way from a low, which would just be you know, continuing the trend that we've seen, which you know might be you know, eight to nine inches of sea level rise, all the way up to this extreme, some, at, and this could be, you know, over uh, uh, the 10 feet of sea level rise potentially or more. Um, and then all of these different projection scenarios in between. And they all relate to things like what are the greenhouse gas emissions going to be in the future? How sensitive is the climate to the greenhouse gas emissions? How sensitive is the sea level to all of it? And so there's a lot of uncertainty that gets packed into this. All right. And so one of the things that you often get when you work in sea level rise science is you get is you get people who angrily want to know, give me a number, give me the number, what is the number that's going to happen. And, and so uh, this is actually from something that I wrote, and, and then I use it as a joke now, it actually comes from a NOAA report, but, but, but this is the sentence that we use, is that we have high confidence between eight inches and 6.6 .6 feet by 2100. Okay. And um, and actually now that's that's gone up, you know, so now the high end estimate is even higher than that. And so just think about that for a moment, you know, that that uh, the eight inches we can deal with, you know, say 10 feet. Um, that is obviously catastrophic. Even three feet is going to be catastrophic. And so anywhere in between there. And then if you're trying to plan for what are you going to do, what are you going to invest in? That's not that helpful, maybe. So we always go back to this, right? And so again, so now it's even higher of the uncertainty levels if we look at uh, these latest projections. Um, and then if we look at the tide gauges, oftentimes, like, okay, if we look at the tide gauge, what does it show for the, for the data? So this is just something I put together last month for uh, the city of Cape Canaveral. Uh, they have a tide gauge. It's right next to the city of Cape Canaveral. Uh, it's right at the port. And this goes back to 1994. And so uh, we're using two projection scenarios here. If you project this one out, the red line, that would be eight and a half feet or so at the year 2100. Uh, this one here at the lower will be about five feet at 2100. And I defy you to use this and say, okay, which one? 
or is it going to be something else? And then more recently, it's been really alarming. They've had some pretty high water events and then, it, you know, it's come back down. Um, so, so we think we have confidence that it, that, that the sea level rise is accelerating. Um, but exactly what trend we're on, it's still, it still has a lot to do with climate modeling and a lot of uncertainty. All right. And so again, we don't know, right? If you just look at the gauges, there's a lot of signal to noise. Um, and so, and so uh, we always have to go back to uh, what are the climate projections? And sometimes I'll have people say, you know, let's just talk about sea level rise and not about climate change, you know, but as soon as anyone asks you, what is the basis for your sea level rise scenarios, you have to talk about climate change. That, that, that's the only way we get to those uh, really, really extreme curves. Okay. All right. All right, so now let's think about being a local government. Your city councils, your city managers, your city staff. These are the folks who are at the front lines. And so why do we work with local governments? Because they're the ones responsible for things like drainage, uh, stormwater drainage. Uh, they're the ones that are responsible for issuing a permit when someone wants to build something. And they that we're seeing within the coastal areas, the evidence of sea level rise is already really apparent. And it and has to do with, especially in areas that are really low lying, like the Keys, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing the wetlands expand, uh, they're going into upland areas. We see this up in North Carolina a lot. We see the ghost forests. But even in areas that are like really built out, um, we see it within stormwater systems. So we have a lot of old stormwater systems that were built in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and uh, we have pipes going straight out into the estuary, and they have oysters, they're clogged, uh, they were not, they were not built for that height of, of the sea. So the, I oftentimes use this analogy, just just when I'm dealing with planners, is we, um, so it's not about like trying to figure out and guess exactly what sea level, but what are you building? So if you're building a garden shed, right? And so building a garden shed, you'd have to be really risk averse to think about, okay, I want to make sure my garden shed is going to be very resilient to 12 feet of sea level rise. You know, just imagine, you know, you put it up on, on, on huge piers and you're trying to figure out how to get your lawnmower out, All right? That's ridiculous. But then if you have a nuclear power plant, right? And so even I talked to a lot of engineers, I don't mean to pick on engineers because I know the Center for Wetlands is actually in the engineering school. Engineers are the ones just this kind of a stereotype. I've talked a lot of engineers, sea level rise isn't a thing or it's not as extreme as anyone thinks it's gonna be. But I'm like, okay, are, are you so confident that you would build a nuclear power plant without thinking about the worst case scenario of sea level rise? And the answer should be no, that, that you're, very, you're very, very extremely risk averse with something like a nuclear power plant. You don't want this taking on any water, right, at all. All right. So, okay, so if we think about impacts of sea level rise, and so if you're thinking again about a local government, the first thing that floods is the stuff that's underground, right? And that makes perfect sense. So you have stormwater drainage infrastructure, you have pipes, you have outfalls, again, that go into estuaries. And we see in a lot of areas like Brevard County, uh, over here on the Space Coast, there's a lot of wastewater infrastructure that was built in the 50s, 60s, right when we had the boom, um, uh, with NASA, with the race to the moon. And a lot of that wastewater infrastructure is just nasty because it's, it's just getting impacted by a lot of salt water and the groundwater and it's just decaying. And we see a lot of wastewater that, 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 that we have a lot of issues. Then you'll start seeing things like saltwater flooding of yards and roads. I'm sure you've seen pictures you know, of like Miami Beach where you see water going in roads. There's no storm, there's no hurricane, there's no rain, just from a really high tide. That's usually when people start to panic is when they start seeing water in the roads when it's not raining. And then you kind of go, uh, uh, you go down the line here, right? So then things like electrical substations, I worked in the Keys, I did a lot of vulnerability assessments there. They were very worried about the electrical substations. As it turns out engineers are smart in the sense that they build electrical substations high because, because electricity and water don't mix. Um, so those tend to be the last things that you see flooding, right, usually but all these other things in between. All right, so with stormwater, so this is just a little cartoon showing that, that again, in the bad old days before the Clean Water Act, a lot of pipes going out in the estuary, the engineers typically would try to leave some space, especially in Florida where you don't have a lot of slope or gradient and you wanna have some tailwater. Um, and so, so, so you typically have 
uh, this type of situation. Then you get sea level rise. What happens? You know, you start getting water into the pipes, uh, especially at high tide. It starts raining. I hear this a lot when I talk with local governments and public works people. They're like, it used to drain when it rained. Now the same storm, it doesn't drain as fast. And this is what's happening, you know. And then, and then again, when people panic is when the water comes out the other side, right? Sometimes you'll see the stormwater drains will become the conveyance for the seawater to go through and actually discharge into roads and neighborhoods and that kind of thing. And when you start seeing salt water coming the wrong way, you've got a big problem. Um, so again, here's an example here. So Tybee Island, Georgia, uh, this is the first community uh, that I worked in with sea level rise. I actually drove from Athens all the way down to Tybee Island four and a half hours with a graduate student. I didn't tell them why. I'm like, we're going to Tybee and we're going right to this area. Of course, I picked the king tide. I knew that I knew it was in a flood. Uh, this was a wetland that they had filled back in the 30s, we think. So this used to be this used to be a marsh over here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but but someone had the great idea to just go ahead and keep the marsh up on top of itself and build some land. Those tend to be the areas that flood first, right? Surprise, surprise, right? And so and so what we see is there in king tides that the water comes out. It comes out of the stormwater pipe. If it rains really heavily and you live here, uh, the public works guy who's now retired said. Uh, you just run for the second floor. That's what you do. Uh, that's your adaptation strategy. There's nothing you can do. Okay, so let's go down to Satellite Beach over on the Space Coast. So uh, we had a Florida Sea Grant project. Uh, we worked with the Geoplanet University of Florida on this one. That was 2016 to 2019. Um, and, and so uh, what we did with that project, Satellite Beach um, is kind of the poster child for sea level rise planning in Florida. They were one of the early communities that started planning back in, I want to say 2008, 2009 is when they started doing vulnerability assessments. Um, and so by the time we started working with them, they were wanting to do policies and do recommendations and just get into implementation. Um, okay, so uh, we have the 100-year flood. And so the 100 year flood ends up being really important uh, when you're dealing with any kind of sea level rise and any kind of floodplain. And the reason why is within uh, the United States, the 100 year flood, um, and, that's, and that's the 1% chance flood, right? Annual return interval. Um, it's not if you get flooded, it's not going to come back 100 years. People misunderstand that a lot. If you have a 1% chance, if our maps are right, which they usually aren't. Um, but you'll see within satellite beach they have very little floodplain but they're very worried about flooding okay um and then what what they understood within satellite beach is the 100 year maps that are made by fema through the national flood insurance program so it's a federal program almost all the insurance uh, uh that we have for flooding is actually through the federal government but they don't account for a few things one is they don't account for climate change and sea level rise they absolutely do not do that and for two, they don't account for local stormwater conditions, right? They don't look at local stormwater infrastructure. They don't see how it functions. You can get credit if you, um, of the local governments that do that, but, but the feds do not do that because they say they don't have the resources. All right. Okay. So what we did in Satellite Beach is we went in and we mapped and they had a lot of great maps. So they had a pack rat who was in their public works and he kept all their old surveys for all their old stormwater, which is unusual. You'd be surprised. I know I was surprised to learn. You go to coastal communities in Florida and Georgia and elsewhere, people don't know where their stormwater is, right? Or they don't have it mapped. They don't have it in GIS. There are places that do. Here, what we did is we worked to get everything into GIS. And so I had some students work and take their surveys and take their CAD files as we mapped everything. Um, it turned out there were about 39 outfalls that go into uh, the Indian River Lagoon in a really small city. That's just in Satellite Beach. Okay, so here's some of my students that were out there. Oh, wait, that's an FSU cap. What's he got? Okay. Um, uh, there's my son. Uh, uh, he was in training with me down the Keys, and I know that's probably running afoul of child labor laws, but but that but but he was helping me um and i just have to always give this this isn't a satellite beach but i but i mapped almost all the outfalls in the keys i went out and found these things i was in stock island and if someone asked me after i've been out there five hours they're like are you here for the crocodile removal and i'm like what um and and it was a gives a little crocodile apparently but i didn't see it and um yeah that was a little startling um so anyway in satellite beach 
Um, so what we did and what they're interested in is they had noticed that in their stormwater system that again hooks up to the river in the Indian River Lagoon, that they noticed that their stormwater system is swamped a lot. That, that, that within of the stormwater conveyances, there is water from the lagoon and they were just interested as to what does it look like now? What's it gonna look like in the future? Uh, do we, uh, what do we do about it? So we went and we, uh, and we looked, so here's what it looks like even just right now, you know, 2015 water levels that um, you have water in your pipes and you can go out and you can verify, it. you can go look into the grates and they have a lot of water and it rains a lot and it floods. That's what happens. Um, and then we got into uh, looking at uh, uh, things like hurricanes and floodplain maps. And so this is the National Flood Insurance map for uh, Satellite Beach. And so this is a 100-year floodplain. And if you notice, very little of the city is actually in the 100-year floodplain. Um, and so we have a little bit along the Atlantic coast, and we have a lot that is mostly in the canals that are uh, right along the canals, uh, 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 that is right along the river, but very surprisingly, very little is in the 100-year floodplain. So we did some hazardous mapping, which is a FEMA product, and so it's another thing you can use uh, to look under your flood maps, and this was with a uh, University of Florida Geoplan. This is what we came up with for an existing 100-year flood, a coastal flood, using uh, this tool called Hazus, again, by FEMA. And this is what we came up with. <laughs> um, and you can see those don't agree. And, and, um, and so we were alarmed because at the same time, a FEMA was going through and making uh, changes to the flood maps. And this is what they were going to come up with, a little changes. But, and we're like, we have this and we don't want to confuse people. So we had a lot of conversations. And what we learned is that, um, that there are a lot of differences between these two FEMA products. This is for insurance and for property. This is for human life. Um, and this is for evacuations and for things like critical infrastructure. So even the modeling for floods that, that let, uh, this is probably way too conservative. <laughs> this is maybe overly aggressive, um, but, but it has to do with what are you valuing and what is the risk that uh, you're trying to approach, right? So even with flood mapping, how you're thinking about risk ends up affecting uh, your maps, even through the same federal agency. All right. And so, uh, so this is the fire station uh, with Satellite Beach. And so I was working there, working on these flood maps. And they're like, you know, we're getting ready to... Um, uh, we're at the end of the 30 year life cycle for this fire station. We're trying to decide what we should do. You know, should we just go ahead and fix this up a little bit or should we move it? Uh, 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 the river is actually right behind uh, the fire station and they had seen flooding in the road here. And they're like, even though it's not an under your floodplain, we're a little bit worried. Uh, you're working on flooding and why don't you go ahead and do a site investigation? And so what's fascinating is if you look at the 100 year floodplain map, nothing in this picture is in the floodplain, including the canal, which, <laughs> which, which, you know, should give you, you know, uh, should tell you to be careful, right, about your floodplain maps. And so we had all these elevations um, and, um, and then uh, we actually did the first floor for the fire station, which was about five feet above sea level. Um, and then, so we just used the hazardous map and, and if you believe that model, um, that on a 100 year coastal flood, there'd be four feet of water inside the fire station, you know, that, that would be the depth in the fire station. So I showed that to the fire chief at the time and he said, you are crazy. He's like, that would never happen. That and, and I don't know what this has this model is or what scenario it is that would cut, but that's not gonna happen. Um, and, and then he asked me, what would it look like? What would that scenario look like? Has this doesn't tell you, I'm like, you know, all I could say is maybe if a tropical storm stalled and dropped like 40 inches of rain on you um, and the wind was from an unfavorable location, you know, I could see maybe that happening. And he's like, that would never happen. Um, all right, so this is just showing the depths there. Okay, and so then I was scheduled to go and talk to the city council and you can't make this stuff up, right? And so I was driving in to go to Satellite Beach, talk to the council, everyone else was leaving because this is what it looked like at the time for Irma. So Irma at that time was forecast to hit right at Satellite Beach 
is a category four, or category five storm. Fortunately, it didn't do that. Um, but of course, everyone was evacuating, um, you know, thinking this could happen. And so I was there to suggest they might want to move their fire station. And I'm like, you might have want to moved it several years ago. Um, and then uh, the fire chief was there and he came up to me right before the meeting because he had kind of in he kind of suggested that he was going to push back a little bit. Um, but then he was like, I'm not pushing back because he had just returned from a helping out with the Harvey response. He's like, I understand what could flood the fire station. now. I understand. You don't need to convince me anymore. You know, he'd seen it. He'd seen Harvey. Um, and, you know, so these, these kind of events, you know, that seem improbable seem to be happening with more frequency and uh, no one would have thought these areas would have flooded with Harvey, you know, and it was like, I don't know, like 50, 60 inches of rain over the course of just a few days. Uh, that can do some weird things to your hydrology. All right. So uh, uh, they did move or they're in the process of moving the fire station. Um, so this is the site that's going to it's a it's a uh, um, it's a high and dry spot, at least relatively <laughs> for for the coast. Um, so that's just in the news there. Uh, I'm very proud of that story that that, that actually the city council listened uh, with some help from a hurricane and other things. But um, and so uh, they are going to move the fire station to this more resilient spot. All right. So now we're going to go up to St. Mary's, Georgia. And okay, this is right over the border um, from Florida. And I was working at UGA at the time when I got this project because my plan was to come back to Florida anyway. So St. Mary's was about as close as I could get. Um, and so, um, so here's what it looks like in St. Mary's if you're right on the main street. And, um, and so some of these buildings date back to the 1830s. Um, and as far as we can tell, the stormwater infrastructure might go back to the 1880s um, within this area. Um, and, and this is what it looks like when you're facing North on Osborne Avenue. I love to drink at this bar um, as well. Seagulls is a great bar if you have an opportunity. Um, and this is what it looks like if you're looking the south. And so Florida is on the other side of the St. Mary's River. There is a stormwater infall right here. The outfall, I could never find it because, because someone piled all sorts of rocks and rubble on top of it. Um, and so we know it's over there somewhere, but, but I never set eyes on it. And what happened is the folks here complain. They're like, you know, when it rains heavily at high tide, there's a lot of water in the streets and it looks uncomfortably close to coming into our hotel. Um, so that's why they wanted us to look at this site. Okay, I don't know why that keeps doing that. So, um, so what we did is I worked with some of the UGA folks and we developed for this little stormwater basin itself, we did a 25 year rainfall at high tide and said, you know what, if we get that rainfall event based upon your storm system here, this is where we think water is going to pool up. That includes the hotel, that includes the bar, and includes a bunch of other places here that uh, you don't want water in. Um, so about a foot of water uh, that's going into folks' uh, uh, houses and businesses. And so I went and talked to everyone. I'm like, you know, is it okay? I went to the city council and said, do you want me to show this in front of the city council? They said, sure. Uh, we want you to, you know, that that's what you're here for. Um, so that was April of 2016. Um, and again, you hate to get tests for this, but then so uh, uh, this is Hurricane Matthew, and this is October 7th of 2016, just a few months later. So this was a hurricane, and there was a storm surge that happened, um, and they got water, about a foot of water at its height went into the hotel and went to the bar. Um, and I wish it wasn't doing that. Um, and then you might say, okay, so that's a hurricane. And then, and then it's true, there's a hurricane, but USGS put out gauges and they are heroes when there's hurricanes. USGS goes out and puts out all these storm surge gauges and they happen to put one right at the edge of Osborne Street. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but they had a bunch of other in St. Mary's and our gauge there, that surge gauge was about a foot higher than any of the other ones. And I asked USGS, like, like can, you know, what happened there? And they, they, we don't know. What we think happened is it was a 25 year rainfall event as well. So you had a pile up of the rainfall, the water couldn't leave. That also helped uh, to make the storm surge higher, we believe. Uh, anyway, that was enough to convince the city council. They were working at the time on doing a whole bunch of beautification on, on uh, uh, Osborne, they were gonna put in like child splash pads and new sidewalks. And we're like, maybe you should also fix the stormwater infrastructure 
they weren't so interested until the flooding happened and then they got really interested in it. And so, um, so, uh, and so green infrastructure, this concept of green infrastructure, hopefully you guys have heard about this before, it's actually in the Clean Water Act, but the idea within the built environment in particular, trying to go back and mimic what the natural system looks like using all sorts of different things, you know, uh, that can be a wetlands and rain gardens, it can be a pervious pavement, there's a whole litany of things. And so uh, we worked with St. Mary's and we convinced them to actually go to EPA, they got some 319 money uh, through uh, uh, the EPA. And so uh, this is just, again, some more, uh, some more green infrastructure uh, from EPA, their propaganda. Um, and so when you're doing green infrastructure, you go through this whole process of organizing your stakeholders, a vision, and it helps to get flooding, right? I'll say that as well. I mean, that, that, that might sound harsh, but the way you convince people to get green infrastructure is when they see damages, and then they get really interested really fast. Um, so anyway, St. Mary's, they worked and as part of their vision and planning here for Osborne, they did incorporate green infrastructure directly into the beautification. They got some grants through the 319 program. They worked with some engineers. And, um, and so here's some of what they've done. So they've got a lot of pervious pavement. They put a lot of pocket rain gardens and a lot of pocket wetlands within their streetscape. Um, and at least anecdotally, they've... They, They've had some pretty significant events there since all this has been installed, and apparently the flooding issues are drastically improved uh, within uh, this area, just with a few little interventions. Uh, so is this going to last forever if you get six feet of sea level rise? No, but at least for now, um, it's had some impact within this area. So here's again some, some of their wetlands, uh, some rain gardens, uh, some examples here. All right. So now let's go to Cape Canaveral. And, and this is an active project I have with Cape Canaveral. And this is through uh, the Regional Sea Grant, which is, uh, this is a, a consortium of Florida Sea Grant, of uh, Georgia Sea Grant, South Carolina Sea Grant, and North Carolina Sea Grant. And we're working in communities in all of those states. And so uh, we're, uh, we're working down in Cape Canaveral. Um, and just to show you Cape Canaveral and just the context here, we've got uh, the Banana River, here we have NASA, which is up in this area here, um, and um, so very very low lying, um, highly altered coastline, especially within the built areas, um, and they also have very severe water quality issues within uh, the river. And so you might have heard about the manatee deaths that have happened this year. This is like ground central. A lot of algal blooms start within this area, um, and so there's a lot of reasons when we're thinking about sea level rise and resilience to also look about how can we do some restoration as well. Um, all right, so uh, once we started working, and so this project, we, we had all these ideas that we were gonna have all these workshops, uh, community workshops. We started in uh, March of 2020. <laughs> and so you, know, you can see from the mass, this was pretty early in the COVID world. Um, so th so this was our first on the ground visit that we had. Uh, there in the city and we did a little tour so this uh this guy here he works their stormwater drainage and this is um uh brenda is uh their lead planner for the city of cape canaveral and so we started looking at this ditch they actually call it they actually call it a a uh a uh stream or river but it's really an old ditch so this is uh the canaveral ditch goes through the right through the middle of Cape Canaveral. As far as I can tell, let me go back a slide here. Um, this whole area here, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. This all was filled in again back in the 50s, very mysteriously. No one knows, no one wants to take credit for doing it. We asked the Corps if they did it, they said, nope. Um, and then the city says, we have no records of who did it, but it's here. And even the ditch, no one knows who owns that. So the city maintains it. No one knows how the ditch was made. I can tell you it's straight. So that's not a natural, that's not a natural stream. Um, but they have a lot of flooding issues. Again, where you have a lot of this pack and fill and where you take old wetlands and you fill them in, that's where you typically have the worst flooding issues. And that's what they have in the city of Cape Canaveral. Okay, so we've got the ditch here. And so of course, being Cape Canaveral, it's fascinating. For one, this is actually a warehouse not owned by SpaceX, but, it, but it's actually rented by SpaceX and they do some manufacturing in this area. I see a lot of Teslas parked over in this parking lot. When it rains really heavily, 
uh, like in Hurricane Fay or it's like Tropical Storm Fay that happened in, I believe it's 2008, 2009. This apparently flooded pretty significantly. So I always imagine like, you know, Tesla's catching on fire and all that kind of thing. Um, but um, so you have this stormwater drainage. You also have very remarkably, this is eight and a half uh, uh, of acres of land that's undeveloped. Um, right in this area, which that's very unusual to find. And we want that piece. of, And so oh, oh, we need like $10 million. So if anyone has $10 million, please send it to me immediately so we can, so we can get this parcel. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is the ditch. This is, uh, uh, this is whatever they're doing at SpaceX. And this is the parcel over here. Uh, this is what it looks like on the other side. There's a, uh, 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 there's a trailer park that floods. There's also, uh, this is a lift station that's right here that may or may not occasionally have uh, some discharges of sewage um, in the area. So again, Space Coast Brevard County has a lot of problems. Um, and this is just one example here. Um, here's our concept. So for, yeah, for about 10 million bucks, we really would like to do this on, on uh, the eight and a half acres, which would be to take the Canaveral ditch, you know, circuit it over into some kind of pond, have some treatment wetlands in this area, have some beautiful trails going through this area. There are some beautiful live oaks on the property uh, from what I understand. Um, so anyway, um, so again, 10 million bucks, uh, you can send me a check. Uh, uh, right after this talk. Um, and um, some other examples. And so this is just, again, this is like, this is some 1950s, 60s era infrastructure where if we could send someone to the moon, then we can pretty much do whatever we want. This is a wastewater treatment plant um, right here at the bottom, right along the Banana River. And um, this is probably the most vulnerable wastewater treatment plant in Florida to a hurricane, I would think. Um, that it's, it's, it's remarkably close to the river with active erosion that's happening in certain areas. And Irma flooded uh, the parking lot. And then fortunately where, um, and then the surge actually broke through a little bit over in this area. Fortunately, it wasn't here where you can see what that might be. Um, and um, so that that is a, that's a very critical situation. Uh, we're working with the Corps of Engineers, hopefully to get something at least to patch that up. But this area here, Thurm Boulevard, um, is this street here. There's a whole bunch of condominiums that are uh, remarkably expensive for having an overlook of the sewage treatment plant. Um, but it also floods a lot. When it rains, it floods a lot and they have some swales and uh, the soils are terrible. Uh, the water table is right at the top. Um, and um, they also have, again, you can't make this stuff up. They have Florida and aquifer wells that they use for these ponds um, to keep them high at all times. And so those things of course are, you know, like, gee, you have flooding because you're constantly keeping your water table high for, for strange reasons. Um, all right, so anyway. Um, so uh, here's what it looks like on Therm. There's, there's what passes for a swale. Um, and those things do not drain very well. Um, we work with the city and this, I'm gonna blame on University of Georgia. Um, but um, so, so this was a concept, which, which actually this won't work. I'll just go ahead and say that because, because the water table's too high. But the city is interest, really interested in green infrastructure and they don't like having to mow this. And so we're looking into other ideas and, and we had a little workshop with people like, how about planting some wetland plants in this area and making it and then doing some drainage improvements. As it turns out, a lot of people like the wetlands. Uh, there were questions about rats. I don't know if rats like to live in these kind of systems. Um, I think hawks would eat them, but I don't know. But 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 that's one thing I learned uh, working uh, at the city of Cape Canaveral that if you're building green infrastructure, rats are going to be one of the public concerns. Um, so here's so so the, here we are again. This is uh, this in COVID world, uh, January 2021. Had a little workshop. And we gave people like a little informal test where they could put dots here or there, and everyone preferred the flowers. They didn't like the way the swale looks. Uh, this is the uh, this engineer for the city here, and he was telling us, "Yeah, that's great, but this isn't going to work." And he was right. Um, but um, but uh, we are working, uh, uh, trying 
uh, to figure out what would be an option for this area. Uh, there's been a lot of flooding there recently, uh, just even this past year. And, and um, so if you have any ideas, uh, we're open for those, open for collaboration as to what we might want to do in this little location. Okay, and so one more with the city of Cape Canaveral. Um, and so we weren't even looking, at, uh, this wasn't part of the drainage tour that we did back in June of 2020, um, but uh, this one's come onto our radar screen this year. Um, so this is an outfall, goes into uh, the river. Uh, there's an old stormwater outfall right at the end of this park and goes right into the uh, Banana River. Uh, here's what it looks like. Again, you can't beat that 50s era uh, 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 drainage. You just put it and you get it as fast as you possibly can out to the estuary, um, you know, pipes all underground. Um, and a surprise, surprise, it's failing. Um, and so this was a rainstorm that happened in June of uh, this year. And it was about two and a half inches over one hour. And about a five year event over 60 minutes is what I think it was. All right. So, you know, five year event, you'd hope your stormwater system didn't look like this. Um, and so uh, this made people upset because it flooded their houses. <laughs> um, so houses actually had water. They took in water during, as far as we could tell, it was a five-year event. They went out and they were looking for, you know, are there things blocking the pipes? Did a pipe collapse? They sent cameras down. Nothing. Um, uh, this all over Facebook and you know, city council was, you know, they were just being bombarded by people, very upset about the drainage. Um, then it happened again. Um, so this was uh, this was the next month. I don't have pictures of this one, but this was about a 50 year storm over 30 minutes in the same spot. And it flooded the same houses and more in the city of Cape Canaveral. And so people became incredibly upset. And 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 then the good news is there's a lot of interest in green infrastructure now in the city of Cape Canaveral. Um, there's already interest, but now there's even more interest trying to understand what to do uh, within within this watershed. Um, and so just one of the problems is this is the outfall. So this is what it looked like in September of 2021. You can't see it completely swamped, absolutely swamped. I went back. I don't have a picture from this, but this was in October. It was actually coming over the wall. And so it, it happens naturally within uh, the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, we get what's called a fall high tide there, and it happens seasonally. We just call it the fall high water. doesn't really have an, uh, uh, there's not really like a tide each day there, um, but, but, but it rises about a foot in the fall, but it is rising along with the sea and we're seeing this infrastructure really failing um, uh, with uh, the rising sea in this area. Um, all right, so what do you do in this area? And so I gave this talk actually last week, the city, you know, what do you do? You know, the short answer is, you know, this is built out, like this particular watershed is built out. Um, and so, you know, retrofitting every single opportunity you can, curbs, you know, you try to short circuit them. Um, and then really you want to just reimagine stormwater. Um, so, you know, pocket rain gardens, holding, uh, there's no opportunity for something big here. I mean, it's like, it's like really small scale, like what do you do almost uh, with each parcel? Um, or you have to get pumps, you know, that's the other one. And I don't like pumps, most people don't like pumps. Uh, they're expensive and they're hard, but so trying to incentivize homeowners, you know, how do you do all this from the, uh, from the policy side? Um, and a lot of on the planning, and this is where it gets in policy and zoning, a lot of the codes within a lot of the local governments, they say, here is the minimum amount of, that you have to have for parking. You know, like if you're building something, and, and then it's usually for like a big, you know, like say Christmas season, you know, if you have like a shopping center, wrong way to do it. It should be, here's the maximum amount of parking you can have that's paved. And then, and then, you know, trying to minimize and, and so satellite beach is working on that. And there are communities that are getting a lot more interested in that. Um, and where there are opportunities to do these regional systems to redirect the stormwater away from the estuaries which we wanna do that anyway for water quality purposes, but we're seeing again, that it's not just water quality anymore, which we should care about that. We don't as much as we should, but when it starts flooding people's houses, people get very, very interested in uh, the discharges because it's failing. 
you know, you cannot get the water off fast enough like you could in the 60s. And so, all right, so what do we do about that if you don't want to flood? So there's an opportunity there, again, for green infrastructure. We do have to upfront with maintenance and what do you do with rain gardens? You know, are there rats in them? You know, I guess we need to get cats or something else or hawks. No, we don't want more cats in the landscape. Um, but so what do you do about rats? But, but also uh, with any kind of green infrastructure, I struggle with it here at my own university, my own lab, you know, I have a rain garden I planted and the first thing they wanna do is weed whack it down. I'm like, you know, you have to kill me first before you can. Um, and, and so, we'll, oh, oh, we reach understandings of course, but we have to engage with it up front. That, that, that's oftentimes one of the biggest impediments. Um, also acknowledging that nothing is permanent. And that's one of the main things I run into this all the time with, with a lot of well-meaning planners and advocates and activists. They're like, okay, or right, you're going to do this, but what's going to happen if there's eight foot of sea level rise? And like, you know, no one's going to live here. What's going to happen? Uh, that doesn't mean we have to like abandon it like right now and we won't, you know. So then it's OK to think incremental solutions, you know, and I, I have that in quotes with solutions, but um, but things that can make things better. And then and if we do green infrastructure, the idea is you're also paving or uh, we're not paving we're actually creating opportunities for what happens next you know so then if it goes underwater then if you have green infrastructure then maybe it, it becomes something else becomes a wetland it becomes a mangrove forest and we're okay with that whereas you don't want a mangrove uh you don't want a mangrove forest in your house right people typically don't like that idea um but um so so anyway, it's not permanent. Everything, you know, nothing's permanent, right? We're looking for what, succession and that kind of thing. All right. And so this is what we're working on right now. I just had to have like a little, uh, this isn't a systems model. I don't know if Mark Brown's here because I know he beat me up for not having a systems model. But uh, we are working uh, with, with uh, uh, doing landscape scale suitability modeling. And so working with Clemson uh, um, on this project. And so we are like, like where do we cite things at a landscape scale? And um, so I've got some students right now working on this. And, and uh, so anyway, just wanted to throw that on. It's a lot to throw for the last slide, but uh, there's a lot of good science going into what we're doing as well. Um, and so with that, hopefully I have enough time for questions here. And uh, I just wanted to thank all these partners, all, all, all these local governments uh, that I've had the opportunity to work with over the past several years. Um, and um, yeah, well, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. You had some applause uh, from YouTube from uh, Jason Everett, perhaps an old an old friend over there. Um, so we'll take questions now for Dr. Evans. I'll kick us off in case you need a little bit of time to um, think about your question. But I'm thinking about these, you know, the cases. Um, first of all, it was a great talk. I mean, it's like it's an existential crisis that, um, you know, as you mentioned at the end, like, what are we going to do in 50 years? Well, I'll probably move, right? And so um, thinking about the small scale interventions that allow folks to plan for longer term change is just, I, I bet it's, it's a challenge. And you're trying to make help people make good decisions with the acknowledgement that there are long-term reorganization that's gonna occur with or without them, right? Um, so thank you for that. But so think, thinking about these small scale interventions, like the St. Mary's scale, you know, water, um, you know, sewer drainage network that you're developing, you know, plans for, are there, beyond sort of like, you know, shooting from the hip, are there models that are accurate enough at the scale of the small scale intervention to, you know, uh, attribute a, a reduction in flooding to green infrastructure, to do scenario analysis. Um, you know, we know about swim models, we know about LIDAR and stuff. So are, is that something that you can do confidently for um, a community and say, oh, here's th your three choices. And, you know, this one will reduce by a foot, this one will reduce by 18 inches, yada, yada. Are we there? Are we good enough yet? Yeah, folks are working on that. There, there are folks with Georgia Tech, I know, that that are trying to work on that. And of course it's expensive, you know, that, that, that when you get into that, you know, that small scale hydraulics modeling um, and then trying to model the green infrastructure and how it works like with swim. And uh, there are some other, uh, some other uh, uh, the hydraulics uh, programs that people use um, with, within the smaller basins, like, like with that, with that little model that I did for the, for the, for the St. Mary's that I, I, 
I just I just adopted something from uh, the St. Jo- or I'm I'm sorry from the Southwest Florida Water Management District. You know, it was small enough to where you know, like okay, we can we can look at with very high confidence how much impervious covers here. Like what mm-hmm. are like like what are the boundaries of your basin? And it's actually pretty simple. You know, it's just it's a pipe going into uh, the water, and we know what the tides are. And, yeah. We got head over here. You know, so so that one there. You know. Was what we feel pretty confident actually in that one. I'm just be, but it was so, and it was really, but a lot of effort. I mean, a lot of effort, and it was a customized thing. And they actually had really good data. That's the other thing. They had they they had everything surveyed in, you know, and that oftentimes ends up being the limiting factor with a lot of the stormwater. Uh, for example, Cape Canaveral, um, they don't really have like, like they don't have everything surveyed within their stormwater. So, so you don't know what the invert elevations are. You don't, you don't know when any of that is. And so, you know, try to model that, you know, the first thing, so there, there's this, that, and that's one of the the things I talk about a lot uh, of local governments is that even just getting the basic just inventory of the infrastructure to where, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done just on that basic side of things. Right. Then, then, I have to think that like the hydraulics modeling, I mean, it's like, it can be done. It's just, we have to put forward the effort to do it. And again, pick on engineers just for a moment. I'm sorry, but, but like, but, but with green infrastructure, because like when you're looking at, it's not something that fits into the typical engineering a box pumps and you know lift stations and you know, how fast can you get the water off? You know, that, is easier to calculate, I guess. But when you're like looking at like pocket interventions and okay, how much runoff can we capture here? How much can you capture there? You can calculate it, but then, you know, you have like, you really have to put in the work. I mean, you have to, you know, like each one of these things could be a graduate student that would, you know, just to characterize it, you know? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Any other questions from the group? Uh, thanks, Jason. That's a great talk. I, I wanted to emphasize your thoughts about the green infrastructure ultimately succeeding, if you will, towards the, the consumption by the ocean, because I, I think that's one of the things that really chal- challenges me as we face these choices about trying to improve infrastructure or try to resi- you know, increase resilience. We're oftentimes adding things to these shorelines, which inevitably are going to go underwater. And so at what point do we start making decisions about, you know, limiting that additional materials putting into, um, you know, what will be the ocean uh, versus having to say, okay, time's up, we got to go, you know, and, and so either way, I'm just trying to, I agree with the idea of a, a lid or a, a greener approach to that sort of, um, you know, enhanced infrastructure that's trying to buy us time but without creating something that ultimately is going to be left behind, that's undesirable. So thumbs up on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so some folks are like saying with failure, you know, graceful failure, the Mm -hmm. idea of graceful failure that, 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 that we know it's going to fail, right. That there's going to be a time limit for everything. And again, entropy, right. We know that, you know, you build something and it's going to degrade. Right. And so, um, so that, I think having that mindset, which I, which I find that 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 is a difficult thing just to talk about. You know, oftentimes people are looking for solutions and you solve it forevermore. And then once you acknowledge, OK, we're not that that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And and what we're seeing with a lot of these, you know, heroic type uh, of interventions at like Miami Beach, for example, is kind of the poster child there where they've built giant pumps and elevated streets and, you know, put in all this infrastructure and it kind of works, but it, you know, it's also flooding out other people who, you know, lived there before and there's lawsuits and, mm-hmm. and uh, they had a big rainstorm event that uh, knocked out the power. Um, and the pumps didn't work. And then it, you know, created all this m- major flooding. And so thinking about, you know, these heroic things are great until they don't work. And then they tend to be catastrophic when they fail. And then what you're left with is a mess, you know, and then, and then, uh, whereas again, the green infrastructure, if it fails, you know, which it will, you know, again, I just say this is a, this ecological succession and, 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 you know, we can kind of embrace that as ecologists and conservationists, um, which again, it's a harder sell for the general public maybe, but they might be getting there because the other stuff is incredibly expensive. 
Thanks. Um, so if you're a student and you have to run, I'll let you go. But at first, uh, in the chat, I'm putting the link to do the course evaluation. So we always appreciate your feedback, how we can do better next time, what you liked, what you didn't like, you know, of course, um, couched always in positive, critical <laughs> suggestions. But if you can stay with us, Jason, we do have another question from Jason Everett over in YouTube land. He asked which localities um, in Florida or outside are further ahead in the game. So who's doing the better job of documenting infrastructure, building up elevations and prioritizing or obtaining funding, because that's like the big limitation here, right? Since no one has a $10 million check for you, uh, obtaining the funding for the retrofits and the green infrastructure. That is that is a really great question. Oh, Satellite Beach that I mentioned in Florida is um, just one of the top in terms of resilience planning. Uh, Monroe County, I've worked a lot in the Keys. They're, they're also really uh, really advanced in their planning. Um, and um, some other, I know uh, Tampa Bay region, I haven't worked much there, but they're doing a lot of work. I know St. Petersburg and Pinellas County, um, they, they have really advanced planning and they're going on to implementation all the way down to in their stormwater manual they have for the county. They're, uh, they're talking about the tailwater elevations in the future, right, for, for, for your stormwater that you need to account for that. Um, uh, with, within the bay, so that that's you know that's that's really forward thinking, um, but it's really a patchwork, and and so we have some communities that are really far ahead. I will say, even over the past five six years in Florida, um, that was said like five six years ago. There were some communities that were just like totally head in the sand. I'm not going to mention any names, but like you know, there are even some that were like you know we don't want to know where our stormwater is. Because if it's mapped, then we might have to do something about it. I've had people actually say that to me. I mean, just directly, you know, if, you know, then if we know, you know, the EPA might make us fix it, right? <laughs> and so, like, wow. Um, and, and I think what's happening from the flood insurance side as well, that FEMA, uh, they like to pick on the flood insurance program, but they're also, you know, they're seeming to slowly edge in the direction of like, it's not good enough to not know where your stuff is, that, that you, need to, you need to figure out where your infrastructure is, you need to have it mapped, because if you don't, then we're going to not give you credit for knowing where it is, which is how it kind of works now, <laughs> um, that, that they're like, if you don't know where it is, we're going to start jacking up your rates. They haven't, they haven't yet, you know, uh, they haven't yet been that direct, but I think they're edging in that direction, which I think they should. I mean, I, you know, I think it, you know, where if you have a local government where they don't know their stormwater is and then they have flooding issues, you know, why should, uh, yeah, why should we be paying for their insurance? You know, I'll just be very frank about it. You know, I'm like, I'm like I want to stay at your house then at least once a, a <laughs> year, right? <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jason, for uh, for finishing off here at the end of the semester for us. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you soon. Uh, thanks to all the students and everyone out there on YouTube for tuning in. You can always check out the recordings and you know all of the speakers. You can go and watch your own recording, watch your views rack up and put it in your you know annual report and all that stuff. Thanks again. And we will all uh, have a great holidays. You know, look out for yourself. Look out for your, your friends, your family. Take care of each other. And we will see you next semester maybe a little bit live and a little bit um, online. We're gonna do a hybrid next semester. So we hope to see, as long as things work out okay, uh, we hope to see many of you live next semester. All right.